Hello Internet and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That Africa Wednesday. It's no secret that in the US we love our food about as much as we like liberating oil rich countries from their oppressive mineral resources. In fact, we love food so much that the US government actually pays about $25 billion a year to farmers. Now to put that in perspective, that's a little under 5 times what we pay for all environmental protection. So why are we paying farmers so much and how does this affect Africa? Now in the US, farm subsidies really became big during the Great Depression, a time when the US government was about as willing to spend money as Donald Trump at a cash for gold to restart the economy. At this time, the US actually paid farmers either not to produce or to destroy their food in order to raise the price of food. Now, while this sounds counterproductive to the point of cruelty, it was designed to keep the quarter of the US population that worked in agriculture afloat. Since demand for food remained the same, the limited supply increased the prices and kept farmers happy. Now this lasted until the 1970s when technology made food so efficient to produce, paying farmers not to produce on certain acres of land became about as pointless as paying arsonists not to set fire to certain floors of an office building. So faced with the prospect of food prices falling again and the lack of ability to regulate the supply of production, what could the US do? Bountiful wheat harvests are a way of life in the United States. Lumber crops year in and year out and government price supports have meant surpluses measured in the millions of bushels. Now the United States has agreed to sell some of that wheat to Soviet Russia and her satellites Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria and Hungary. Presently the US has a wheat surplus of a billion bushels. The sale to the communist nations will reduce that by 250 million bushels. Yes, we started to focus on the supply side of the equation, increasing the price of our food by selling it to other countries. That Russia deal, which happened in 1972, was the impetus of this new food export idea, and the terms were so favorable towards the Soviet Union, I'm surprised Trump wasn't somehow involved. This new export strategy worked too well and the increased food prices actually led to rampant inflation in the US, which led to a final tweak in our agricultural policy. In 1973, President Nixon, Secretary of Agriculture Earl Butts responded by calling upon American farmers to plant fence row to fence row, and he told them to get big or get out. Now this led to our current subsidy system where Butts provided two solutions to the price of food dropping too low while US production was still in full force. First, we'd look to international markets and do everything we legally could to shove our food down foreigners throats. And second, if the price of food was still lower than the cost of production, the US governments will pay the difference between cost of sales and cost of production directly to the farmers because America loves free market capitalism. This new reality led to... In the US, roughly 40% of the food we produce never gets eaten. That's over 365 million pounds of food each day. We may waste most of our food, but at least we managed to follow the circuitous route of government impulses and finally arrive at cheap food. So how does all of this affect Africa? Well, in 2015, the World Trade Organization, or WTO, had its 10th meeting in Nairobi, and African leaders had some choice words for Western countries. We, the members, are the WTO. Trade rules in agriculture must be fairer. Trade distorting domestic support is damaging African agriculture an industry. So why is any of this a problem? I mean, if you're a farmer in Nairobi, my condolences. But if you're a normal African citizen, on the surface, this could sound like an opportunity instead of a problem. Ricardo was an economist who had an idea called comparative advantage, in which certain countries, because of environment, size, or capital accessibility, are objectively better at producing certain things than other countries. The US is great at agricultural production, just like Russia is ideal for depressing news stories. The best example of a country adhering to Ricardo's principles is Saudi Arabia, which imports more than 70% of its food, and yet is very successful because it invested its resources in developing an oil industry while taking advantage of the cheaper than market value food provided by the US. 
Now compare that with Nigeria, the country with the largest oil reserves in Africa. It produces as many barrels per day as Kuwait and Qatar, but unlike those countries, Nigeria has a privatized oil industry, so it sees those profits either going to pirates and robbers who steal hundreds of millions of barrels a year, or truly evil criminal organizations like British Petroleum and Dutch Shell Company. They are investing plenty in agriculture, claiming that it's the new oil, although the old oil didn't seem like that bad of an investment. So what's wrong with this economic analysis? Well, The main problem is that, in addition to economic theory called Dutch disease, which a country identifies as a comparative advantage and goes all in on that industry while neglecting the rest of the economy. While this does lead countries to succeed while their commodity of choice succeeds, it leads to their investments being about as diverse as Trump's cabinet. Most notably though, it actually leads to neglecting the majority of the economy. Ghana discovered oil in 2007, started oil production at the end of 2010. Even though oil has now become Ghana's second largest export commodity after gold, economic growth has slowed down from about 15% in 2011 to 3.5% by 2015. The agricultural sector in Ghana today is growing at 0.04%. Agriculture is a major segment of the economy. Ghana is investing half as much as it did when it had no oil in infrastructure. So why is domestic agricultural production the solution to this problem? Frankly, until you start throwing in the subsidies, agriculture is cheaper for countries than pretty much every other industry. All you need is land, seeds, basic irrigation, and the insane desire to want to wake up before 4 in the morning to maintain plants all day. Agriculture is the ideal industry for a developing nation because it helps engage the rural people in the economy while not flooding the city. This makes agricultural development a key component to raising wages in the poorest populations. And I think it's pretty clear at this point why subsidies and free food could be detrimental to some of the developing economies, but I'll take a second to spell it out in case Trump or anyone else denser than the middle of a black hole is listening. Subsidies distort the food marketplace by allowing farmers to produce their food at a loss. In the US, without subsidies, farmers would actually be losing substantial amounts of money because the food we produce is worth less than the sum of its parts. This means that, when it comes to exporting food, we can outprice any new entrants on the market. The US and Europe distort the price of food to make it hard for new entrants from countries that can't afford subsidies. Eh, we don't care, what are you going to do, sue us? Actually, please don't do that. So back to the old bill one more time. They said it was unfair. Mm -hmm. WTO got involved. Brazil won. Yes. They got $12 million a month until the sequestration took place and America said we're not going to pay that anymore. You have no idea how hard it was to find an English report on that story. That was referring to a lawsuit Brazil filed against the US and won back in 2003. Specifically called DS-267 or the Brazil-United States Cotton Dispute if you don't believe me and want to look it up. In this case, Brazil used the WTO to dispute the US cotton subsidies and won. How awesome is that? Brazil worked with the very organization that's accused of exploiting so many through expanding free trade to sue one of the main exploiters of free trade abuse. That said, this ruling actually made things worse for Africa, because instead of changing our cotton subsidy problem, the US government now subsidizes Brazilian farmers as well. Because, much like everything else in US agriculture, farmers' profits haven't been organically or sustainably growing for decades. Interestingly enough, there are some real world numbers for how cotton subsidies alone affect Africa. Oxfam, or the Oxford Committee on Famine and Relief, predicts that removal of US cotton subsidies would increase the price of cotton by 6 to 14% increasing the West African income by 2 to 9%, which would be enough to support food expenditure for an additional million people. But don't worry about them. I'm sure the US will be willing to give them all the free food they want. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube. I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of Africa Wednesday, click here. Click here to subscribe, and remember to like our video down below. And if you're really a fan, you can join our Facebook group. It's just a party over there.